Okay, well, what we're going to do this morning is talk, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context in which we are building our, our new economy, uh, the context of our economic times. Um, and, uh, and then Tina Clark is going to speak more about uh, some uh, really fascinating and fabulous uh, uh, methodologies for uh, assisting with the transition to the new economy that, are, that have been uh, pioneered for the last number of years under the banner of transition towns. Um, okay, so this, as you might gather, that's the, that's the cover of uh, a, a book. And uh, so I, I want to unpack for you and over the course of the next few minutes what that book says, uh, which is as follows. Um, here's world GDP per capita for the last 2,000 years. Uh, as you can see, economic growth is a pretty recent phenomenon, actually. We, we tend to think of it as being sort of normal and natural. Maybe not we, us in, in, in this room right now, but uh, certainly mainstream, no, excuse me, conventional economists, old style, old school economists, yes, <laughs> tend to think that way. And, I, and, and as a result, politician, every politician does, I think. It's pretty safe to say. Um, but why, why all of this GDP growth just so recently and so much population growth just in the last couple of hundred years? You know, in, in the whole history of humanity on planet Earth, we're talking about an eye blink of time, really. Well, I think this is, this is a, a, a big clue right here, global energy consumption, uh, which has exploded in this time. And as you'll, you'll see, uh, the, the, the little colored bands right at the top are uh, renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, and hydro. We're getting about two to three times as much energy from renewable sources today as the world was getting in 1830. And that's with three or four times as many people. So on a per capita basis, we're actually getting less energy today from renewable sources than we were a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, almost all of the growth has been in fossil fuels. Why? Well, fossil fuels are special. Uh, I'm an anti-fossil fuel guy, by the way. I, I, I am a senior fellow for Post Carbon Institute. That should tell you something right there. But I think it's important that we give fossil fuels their due. They are extraordinary. They were created by nature over tens of millions of years. They are energy dense. They're portable. They pack an enormous wallop uh, for their weight and volume. Um, Maybe you've had the experience of running out of gas in your car and pushing it off to the side of the road, maybe 10 feet. That's a lot of work. Imagine pushing your car 20 or 30 miles. That would be really a lot of work, something like six or eight weeks of hard human labor. We get that done for us with a single gallon of gasoline for which we're paying, what, $3 and some cents and complaining, right? Imagine that, six or eight weeks of hard human labor energy equivalent for less than $4. You can't get labor that cheap anywhere, and of course that's why we have mechanized every process of production and consumption we possibly could over the past couple of <coughs> centuries. <coughs> now, just as an aside, also imagine building that car from scratch. Suppose you had to make your own car from raw materials, go out and mine the ores and smelt them and, and figure out you know, how to put the thing together. How long would that take you? <clears throat> we'll get back to that in a moment. Well, so all of this economic growth based on cheap energy over a relatively short period of time, uh, you would think that maybe uh, there, there would be some problem with this. Yes, and we've known about that for some time. Um, this report published in 1972 went on to become the best-selling environmental book of all time, Limits to Growth. I read it when I was 21 years old when it first came out, changed my life. My entire adult life has been shaped by this awareness that human society is on an unsustainable, unsustainable course. Uh, what did they say? Well, they looked at 
trends in population, resource consumption, and uh, environmental damage. They extrapolated those trends, and uh, no matter how they tweaked the data, sometime in the first half of the 21st century, industrial expansion reverses itself. Well, <clears throat> how are we doing? Uh, I would suggest we're, we're pretty much there. Now, um, the idea that, that economic growth would have to end at some point is, is, should be intuitively obvious anyway. I, maybe if you haven't seen this little short YouTube video by New Economics Foundation, uh, you really uh, owe it to yourself. It's only a minute long. It's called The Impossible Hamster. Just look it up. Bas basically, I mean, a newborn hamster is a very tiny uh, little organism, and, it's, and it doubles its body weight every week for the first few weeks of its life, grows very rapidly. So here's a little thought experiment. Uh, if you had a magic hamster that could continue doubling its body weight every week for an entire year, 52 doublings, how big a hamster would you have? Would it be a 50-pound hamster? A 500-pound hamster? Well, I'll save you the, the uh, arithmetic. It would be a 9 billion ton hamster. And that's why it's an impossible hamster. It's never going to happen. Well, you know, we're, we have an economy that's basically trying to do the same thing. Obviously, it's not doubling in size every week. But take China's economy, for example. Doubling, uh, it's uh, growing at 10% per year. That's a doubling time of about seven years. So China's economy doubling in size every seven years. How many doublings can China's economy do before it becomes the nine billion ton hamster? So what are the limiting factors? Looking at uh, you know, this report 40 years ago, limits to growth, what, th there were some things that they left out, actually. They didn't take into account the financial system. And as it turns out, that's really important. Um, <clears throat> These are the three limiting factors that it, it appears are, are actually uh, converging to uh, constrain economic growth right now. Uh, debt, wh how, what's that about? Well, I'm sure there are more than a few economists in the room, so I'm, I'm going to oversimplify tremendously, but we can't, we can't not talk about this. Uh, I, I asked rhetorically earlier, what if you had to build your own car? Well, of course, no, nobody does that because we get them built for us with assembly lines. That was one of the great gifts of the Industrial Revolution, powered assembly lines. So with powered assembly lines, we can make stuff in enormous quantities far faster than we could otherwise do. Faster, in fact, than people... <clears throat> at the beginning of this era, we're accustomed to buying things. Uh, automobiles, of course, are the, are the icon of the industrial era. <clears throat> How did we solve this problem of overproduction, making stuff in larger quantities and faster than people would ordinarily buy it? Well, we solved it with a couple of strategies. One was advertising, inventing a whole new giant industry to talk people into wanting more stuff all the time. And that included subsidiary strategies like uh, planned obsolescence, making stuff so that it would reliably break down over a relatively short period of time. Uh, and the other, the other big strategy, though, was consumer credit, helping people to go into debt to buy more stuff. Consume now, pay later. P push consumption forward in time, basically, was the strategy. Uh, and that's, that's worked very well to create more economic growth and more profits to industry. So with all of this economic growth happening, not only did old-fashioned economists theorize that this could go on forever, they also built the expectation into our, the very sinews of our financial system, uh, even our monetary system. Uh, fractional reserve banking has been around for a long time, but uh, up until the 20th century, in most periods, money was tied to real stuff in, in some way or other. Um, you know, even on a dollar bill, it says a prom it's a promise to pay. But a promise to pay what? Well, a dollar. Well, what is a dollar? Up until, you know, a few decades ago, you could define a dollar in terms of gold or silver. Uh, but that, that was a, a practical limit to the growth of the economy because there was only so much gold and silver. So one of the things we did over the course of the 20th century, and there are perfectly good reasons for it, and I'm not suggesting we go back to gold or silver. I think that would be a, a horrible mistake. But 
by c severing that bond, we, we created money that was essentially tied to interest-bearing debt. Go into the bank, take out a loan for $10,000. The banker doesn't search around in the vault for $10,000 that somebody deposited there. No, the, the $10,000 the $10, is created as a deposit in your account. And when you pay back the $10,000, that money dis actually disappears off the balance sheet. It's magic, but of course the interest is not created at the, at the moment the loan is made, so where does that come? It comes from you doing business with other people in the economy who are themselves taking out loans, and as, as long as the whole economy is constantly growing so that the total amount of debt is growing, so that the total amount of money is growing, then theoretically everybody can pay back their loans with interest and everyone's fine. But if the whole thing stops growing at any point, then you have a cascading series of defaults that can wipe out the entire system. And that's kind of what started to happen in the 1930s. Well, the 1980s were a turning point in all of this because as a result of certain innovations, container ships, satellite communications, uh, computer monitoring of in inventories, globalization became possible. So American factory workers were now competing with workers everywhere else in, in the world. Um, <clears throat> that worked to drive down wages, so actual, as I'm sure everybody here knows, American, uh, average American wages haven't increased since the early 1970s. Wages stagnate, so how do we keep the economy growing? More debt, so in virtually every year since 1980, debt has grown faster than GDP, faster than the real economy. So the, if, you, if you take out that $10,000 loan, that's an obligation to repay. For the banker, that same loan is an asset. So the assets of the financial industry have grown faster than the rest of the economy. The financial economy has grown faster than manufacturing or agriculture or anything else. So that means that uh, the financial sector has gained political power within the economy at the same time because, of course, money is not just this neutral means of exchange. It is political power. Here's a picture of U.S. total debt, roughly 1980 to the present. And as you can see, the enormous increase in, in debt hasn't come about just in the government sector. That's what everyone gets excited about these days, mostly in the consumer and corporate sector. And, of course, it changes in 2008. That's when the crisis happens. Uh, basically, we hit limits to debt. People got all loaned up and had nowhere to go. Uh, you can't take on infinite amounts of debt. At some point, the interest payments are so high that you can't, uh, you can't continue to make them, and the bank doesn't want to loan you any more money. Uh, so American households kind of got to that point. Uh, in the middle of the last decade. And so the government has, and the Federal Reserve stepped in as the borrowers and spenders of last resort to keep the economy from imploding upon itself. Uh, one of the great uh, pieces, pearls of economic wisdom of, of the last decade really explains what happened there. Um, Okay, so we have reached limits to debt, certainly in the U.S. And, and many other industrialized countries as well. China's eagerly trying to catch up there, but that's not the only factor. Uh, a, a deeper underlying factor is energy. Remember, energy is what made all of this growth possible in the first place. Uh, and oil is arguably at least the most important <coughs> of our sources of energy. Not only do we get more energy from oil than any other source, but also it's virtually all of our transportation. And trade is transportation for the most part. So without, uh, without cheap oil, the, the, the gears, the wheels kind of grind to a halt. As you can see, world oil discoveries have been declining since about 1964. Uh, world oil production has been stagnant since about uh, 2005. It's not that we're running out of oil. What's happening is we're reaching the end of the era of cheap oil and easy oil. And that has enormous implications, actually. Now, this, this is, you know, not, not, wouldn't appear to be cause for enormous alarm. I mean, after all, we're still producing as much oil today as we were seven years ago, right? But actually, the, the mix is changing. We're going from the high-quality stuff to lower-quality stuff. 
that has less energy in it. So the actual amount of energy that's being produced by the oil industry is less today. Even if you start counting in all the other liquids, uh, ethanol, uh, natural gas liquids, and, and so on, the same conclusion. We're actually uh, getting less energy. And if you take the analysis a step further, we're having to invest more energy for each unit of production. So it's not that you know, we don't produce oil just to you know, sit it there and look at it. We produce it to get energy from it. So if we're having to spend more energy to get it, and it's lower quality stuff, so it has less energy to yield, ultimately, at the end of the day, then we're on a, a, a treadmill going, speeding up in the wrong direction. This is what the oil industry looked like in the 1930s. This is what it looks like today. when. Now, uh, a new exploratory well can cost half a billion dollars and come up dry. The drilling costs in the oil and gas industry are, are exploding through the roof. Uh, and this is true not just for oil, but for gas. And of course, we're being told that we have a 100-year supply of cheap natural gas. Don't you believe it? What's going on in the natural gas industry right now is a bubble. Producers like Chesapeake are losing money on production and they are staying afloat with debt financing. Um, and that is the definition of a bubble. Uh, if you want to read more, there's a, a, a report on our postcarbon.org website that goes into excruciating detail about what's actually going on in the natural gas industry right now. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it, it may look good on the surface. U.S. is actually producing a little more oil right now than, than was the case two or three years ago. Great, problem solved. Well, no. You know, actually, if you look at it uh, on a, on a, uh, a, a, from a deeper economic uh, perspective, we're in, in very deep trouble with regard to energy. How about the environment? Well, uh, weird weather. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but the, the, there are real costs to society from droughts and floods and industrial accidents. This is Deepwater Horizon in 2010. Uh, 2010, uh, the insurance industry totaled up the cost at the end of the year, and it was something like $250 billion from droughts and floods and Deepwater Horizon and all, all the rest. Last year, 2011, just from one incident alone, the, the results of the uh, earthquake and tsunami in Japan costs of over a trillion dollars. So the, these costs are mounting on an annual basis uh, in an exponential way, and you don't have to project them very far into the future before we get to a point where basically uh, no more economic growth is possible because we're spending all our money just cleaning up from the problems we're making. So here we are on this uh, freight train that's uh, barreling down the, the tracks and speeding up all the time. It feels really exhilarating. The wind is in our hair. More jobs, uh, more tax revenues, more returns on investment. Faster, faster. Can't we speed this thing up somehow? Um, but at the end of the day, we live on a finite planet. And this is not just a theoretical observation. It is the, the real situation that is emerging in our world right now. Uh, over the course of this decade, I would say, you know, it's not, you can't identify a, a, a single moment in time when, when growth ceases, but I would say almost certainly this decade is a, a period of of transition for the, the global economy to a, a new, a new, an entirely new phase. And the end of growth is going to have enormous social as well as economic repercussions because we have relied upon a growing pie to feed a growing population of rising tide to lift all boats. And as the tide starts to go out, as the pie starts to shrink, of course it's going to create um, social tension. Now, does this mean we're in for a, a chaotic collapse of the entire global economy? No, not necessarily. There certainly are things that can be done to stabilize the system uh, as we transition to a post-growth economy. Uh, will those things be done? I don't know. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. A chaotic collapse is not out of the question. 
but, uh, but as I say, there are, there are things that, that can be done. But the idea that we can continue to, to grow, that Ch China can continue to grow its coal consumption at 7% per year or, or, or so on, in perpetuity is obviously absurd, and we seem to have reached the tipping point with regard to each of these areas, uh, debt, energy, and the environment. So what does a non-growing economy look like? Uh, is it survivable? Absolutely. It, it, see, we lived in a non-growing economy for centuries and millennia. A rapidly growing economy is an anomaly in history. It's something we, we experienced during our lifetimes, our parents' lifetimes and our grandparents' lifetimes. So that's long enough for it to seem like it's normal, but it's not. So we're just going back to the real normal, okay? What's wrong with that? P potentially not that much if we adjust intelligently. Uh, business can exist in a non-growing economy if we use an ecosystem model, you know, in, eco in an ecosystem Species come and go. Some flourish, some, are, some go extinct. Uh, there's, there's constant competition and cooperation and adaptation going on all the time with a relatively constant rate of energy flowing through the ecosystem. That's how we, start need, we need to start thinking about the economy as a, a steady state system. Now, in a non-growing economy, some things don't work so well, like ex expectations of high returns on investments. Doesn't work so well in a non-growing economy. Doesn't mean no investment is possible. Doesn't mean no returns are possible. But there, there is a reason that traditional societies and religions had a prescription against charging interest on debt. Because in a non-growing economy, that just doesn't work very long. Um, I mentioned the social limits to inequality. That's something we're go desperately going to have to address soon. Otherwise, uh, we won't be able to make this transition in a, in a coordinated, coherent way, and, and a chaotic collapse of some kind will be more or less inevitable. And finally, the role of money is going to change. Uh, money is a very useful tool for trade, mm -hmm. but life is not about trade. Uh, in, again, in traditional societies, uh, trade was confined to actually a pretty small part of normal daily life, especially for people in rural areas. And most people did not live in cities. So we have gotten used to a way of life in which trade it basically has taken over everything. And therefore, money has intruded into all aspects of our lives. Uh, Maybe, yes, we need different kinds of money. We need different, different uh, banking systems. We need uh, community currencies. We need uh, credit clearing systems as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, fractional reserve banking and, and so on. And at the same time, we, I think we need to keep in mind that where we're going is a world with basically less, a world in which money plays less of a role in people's lives and people doing more for each other voluntarily, cooperatively, is more, again, once again, the norm, as it has been throughout almost all of human history. This, a lot of this is going to happen out of, simply out of necessity. We are headed into a, 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 a transitional period in which money is going to be dysfunctional, whether it's uh, a process of deflation in which money becomes extremely scarce, or hyperinflation in which money becomes worthless, uh, the, the official money that we're accustomed to using right now is, is going to be dysfunctional. And whatever new forms of money we are able to create in the meantime, <coughs> which is very important, it's very important that we do that, but th th that's not going to be able to prevent um, a, a shrinkage of the, of the money system as a whole. So finding ways to help people get by with less money is going to be extremely important. Uh, and I, I would suggest anything we do to build a new economy has to be done with a, uh, a goal of making it easier, more possible for people to get by in hard times. 
people will be looking for help. Uh, they, they're not going to be so much interested in a promise of a shiny new tomorrow far, far away as in help in getting by right now. And if a credit union or a car share program or a, a food co-op can help them meet their needs on an immediate basis, so much the better. Obviously, in a non-growing economy, there are lots of things that can still grow, and that's what we should be focusing on. And these are the qualities of a, a gift economy, if you will. They're the, the qualities of, of the economy that, that has been replaced to a very large extent by the, the trade economy or the money economy. So there, there, are many, there are many benefits that can be accrued and achieved in the process of, uh, of, of transition away from a growth economy. And, and we should highlight those. And at the same time, we shouldn't kid ourselves as to what we're, what we're headed into. It's going to be w one of the great turning points in human history, and it's going to be one of one, possibly one of the messiest. So uh, again, our, uh, m my institution web website, postcarbon.org, and uh, a lot of reports and data there to uh, flesh out some of the things that I've brushed over rather quickly. So with that, Tina. It's great to be with you all today. I'm Tina Clark. I'm a certified transition trainer, part of the global transition movement. And it's just great to be with you all, colleagues and friends and all of us together in doing this deep thinking and reflecting. I just feel very lucky to be here. I know we all do. Such a wonderful group of people with such depth of knowledge and experience. And Richard, you are phenomenal in your way of studying this information and translating it into regular language. It's just such a gift. So I have been doing social change work for many years. I, um, let me see if I can get this. I was um, an undergraduate major in um, urban studies and geography and went to Scandinavia to study urban planning and discovered nuclear weapons in Europe. I was from Kansas, didn't know we had nuclear weapons in my home state, <laughs> but um, came back and ended up going to graduate school at the University of Chicago in the public policy school, which was run at that time. I know this crowd knows some of this stuff. Um, the Chicago boys, Milton Friedman, Aliber, and all the, all the guys who went down and messed up the Chilean economy, some of the first neo conservatives um, in the intellectual world, and uh, made it through two years there by hanging out at the Divinity School in the Anthropology Department, <laughs> where they actually did real science as opposed to ideology and uh, fake kinds of, uh, you know, um, shadow uh, fig leaf uh, rationalizations for global power, global corporate power. It's a very interesting experience. Um, and then I went to Washington, D.C. and worked in the peace movement. Uh, some of you know the Coalition for new foreign and military policy that emerged out of the anti-Vietnam War era, and then went to Greenpeace, where I directed citizen action um, for the US. And at that time, in the early 90s, our European colleagues came over and said, we have a problem with global warming, and they gave us the data, and I fell into deep despair. And um, being from Kansas, I thought, boy, I need to find a community where neighbors know each other, where there's some stability. So I took the first job I could find, ended up in western Massachusetts, where I've been for the past 20 years. And I was working with the Sustainability Institute doing some educational programming on climate for labor unions, faith leaders, and um, academics. And we um, and doing some work with Bill McKibben on launching 350.org. And they told me about this transition town thing, and they paid for me to go become trained as a trainer. And as soon as I saw this model, I, I thought, wow, this is the best model I've seen. And now, um, I think all of us, um, I think it's just intuitive, and you don't really have to do the transition town movement thing um, 
we all are doing it anyway. And I just thought I'd share with you some of the pieces that have been um, most powerful. I've now worked with over 100 communities and done 42 of the weekend trainings. And um, I've done it in remote islands and inner cities with uh, you know 98% people of very low incomes from marginalized communities. And in fact, that was the best training I ever did in Pittsburgh, um, where we they got it so quickly as soon as they received the peak oil information and the broader context and some of the tools of transition they just they just exploded with creativity and all these african american women came up to me afterwards and said this is the most empowered i've ever felt in my life so i offered this to you not as a a prescription for how to take action because all of you are my colleagues in doing this work and many of you have been doing it long before me. I'm 52 and I'm still learning and uh, learning from my elders, some of you in the audience. Uh, but just as an invitation to explore some of the deeper dimensions of this really interesting model that um, I think really harkens back to who we are as human beings and helps us move forward in this time of crisis in some very fun and inspiring ways. Um, so the Transition Town movement started in the UK. Um, there are about 1,000 communities involved, and it grew very rapidly from Totnes, a little town in southwest England. It's now spread to 35 countries around the world, and I've trained a lot of the staff um, who have been part of organizations that coordinated this conference <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's just, it's been this big, um, exciting, empowering set of ideas and a network. You don't have to pay anything to join it. It's just a network. You go to transitionnetwork.org, sign up as a project, as an individual. You can sign up your community as a muller, as in mulling it over, whether you want to, you know, take on transitioning your community. But it's just been um, a really fascinating, fun network of people to be a part of. And their slogan is from oil dependency to local resilience. And being a community organizer for over 30 years, I had to experiment myself. And I've come back to using their language. Uh, I think that what happened, I went over and spent a month in Totnes volunteering when I first got involved because I've been a part of five major social change movements and I've watched them rise and fall and I wanted to see if this one was run by a bunch of egomaniacs. I admit it. <laughs> just, we've all been around the block and um, I was just blown away. In fact, they were very humble and kind of embarrassed and they said that people are using this in Brazil and we don't know what to tell them. Um, they have this thing called the cheerful disclaimer. Some of you know the cheerful disclaimer. We we're not pretending to have the answers. We're just a bunch of people in a town that want to help our town. And we'd love to partner with you and share ideas. So that's really all this is. Um, transition is a verb. And wherever you are, we know we're not where Richard has told us we definitely need to be. Um, and, and there's a big gap between here and in the future where we want to be. So we're all in this process of shifting and transitioning, trans transforming our communities. So how do they do it in transition? Unleashing the collective genius of the community. So I've been doing, you know, I'm a certified consensus process facilitator, certified mediator. You know, I've been a trainer for all these national movements. And I'd never heard of collective genius. So I did some research, and it's absolutely fascinating. And some of you know this body of work. It's, it's how we're smarter as a group, and what are the conditions to help us come together as teams, as groups, and unleash our collaborative collective genius. And I, I looked at the transition model and realized that they were helping people establish all the components of achieving collective genius. And some of the things that become possible when we come together with parking our egos at the door at least a little, um, is that, is that we're, we can do things beyond language, beyond even conscious thought. There was a, an example that was very thoroughly studied of a ship that was docking in port on the west coast, and there were 11 um, people who were in charge, engineers and um, you know, shipmates who were in charge of running different parts of this complex electronic system to bring the ship into harbor. And the system failed. And they had a very short number of minutes to try to figure out how to prevent not only their own death, but a massive explosion and collision with the coastline and in the harbor. And they, they were able to without when the when the transcripts and the tapes were replayed and replayed and like they looked at the documentation they were able to improvise and come up with a manual system working together to stop the ship 
And it was extraordinary. And you maybe have seen the YouTube video of the people who saw someone get run over by a car and they lifted the car. This, there's an amazing capacity within us. You know, you've heard the studies, how we only use a small proportion of our brain. Well, the collective genius research gives us some hints and the neurological research that's been coming out um, that talks about how we need connectedness and caring, about how we need connectedness and caring in our relationships in order to achieve great insights. And the transition movement, I was just dumbfounded. Like, how did this group of permaculture designers and small business people and, you know, corporate consultants and computer guys. I mean, how did they come together and figure out more than all of us who've been, you know, trying to do this? And I think it's just permaculture. If you know permaculture, it's observe and interact. I think it was their open-heartedness. I think it was the spiritual practices and personal growth work that every one of the core team leaders has personally done. I think there was just a non-ego and the team and then all of a sudden, people picked up on the love and the caring, the enthusiasm, and they started to spread it. And so this is a very humble group of people who are not pretending to have the answers, but are simply trying to study and understand what is it that helps a community come together and become very resilient. So just a few thoughts here. Um, we know we don't have much time. That's just James Hansen telling us we don't have much time. Um, we know that we're already experiencing the climate crisis. All the stuff that I panicked about in 1991 is happening now, just as they even worse than they predicted. And so, you know, we know that the wealth gap has started to have an enormous impact. We've this. I just wanted to share this with you in case you don't know the Pew Research Center and their results, because this is a fundamental. <coughs> component of resilience is that we take the challenge of equity seriously. And with the crisis in the housing bubble and the whole recession, we've seen that the median net worth of many communities that are already marginalized has dropped. Um, Hispanic lost their median net worth, um, went down by 66% in four years. The African American community over 50%, Asian Americans as well. And the wealthiest 10%, of course, increasing their share during this time. So we are not going to be resilient unless we address this fundamental problem. And transition is the first process that I've seen really including equity at the center without hitting people over the head. I did, um, I, I could tell you so many stories, but I've had tea partiers, I've had people who absolutely are racist come to events, but they stay because it's community and it's neighbors, and we're able to begin a deeper dialogue. Um, transition, Greater New Haven, has as a transition street in a community that's half Latino, one quarter black, one quarter white. All these like naive, you know, money white <laughs> folks, college professors, <laughs> moving into the neighborhood and trying to make friends with the illegal immigrants and the uh, prostitute across the street and the the, um, the drug dealers around the corner. There's a motorcycle gang too, and I was talking last week with one of the, the founders, and he said, well, you know how we decided to deal with the motorcycle gang? Because they ride up and down the street at 80 miles an hour. He said, we decided to make friends. <laughs> So we invited him to a party. <laughs> and it's this kind of energy that is all throughout the transition movement. So the transition concept is that a town, that old-fashioned, resilient, human, tribal, organizational level of the village and the town um, and the tribe, if we use much less energy and resources, we can have a better quality of life. That if we sit back and use our collective genius, we can make ourselves more resilient as all these challenges unfold. Rob says, this is Rob Hopkins, one of the founders of um, the transition movement. I believe that a lower energy, more localized future in which we move from being producers, I mean, from consumers to producer consumers, where food, energy, and other essentials are locally produced and economies are strengthened. So he was saying this way back, and I think it's it's been just viral that you don't, you know, we don't even need anybody to tell us this. We just all recognize it. Um, many people, if we go and talk about the problems, it, it just puts them 
right into crisis and nightmare. So I want to shift now to talk about how we do transition some of the components. Um, when you go to people and say the technology choices we've made are sending us over a cliff and their whole lifestyle and their habits, human beings, our species is to have habits and to have ways of living. It's very challenging for us, as we were hearing from Alicia last night. Um, it's very hard for us to change our habits by ourselves, and guilt and knowledge and information just doesn't do it. We have to, we, we will react and, and years of studies of smoking cessation and alcoholism and other kinds of um, habits that people want to change, uh, they, they get overwhelmed by too much bad news. Once they understand they need to change, they don't need more bad news. And that's where we've made a mistake in the progressive movement. That's why I switched from doing political activism. I got arrested with Bill McKibben in 2000, you know, at the US Capitol, you know, I, I'm working for Greenpeace. I, I, I still do all my political activism, but now I, I devote my energies to helping communities talk to neighbors about the positive and the transitioning. Because many people will do exactly this. How many of you have relatives that they do this when they see you starting to talk about your favorite political issue of the hour? And of course, families are the hardest place to go. And you shouldn't judge your capacity to change the world based on your family reaction. So. <laughs> It took me 20 years with mine, and now they're all buying green power and, you know, feeling guilty about flying to Turkey. They still are flying to Turkey. That's where they leave today. And I sit here driving my Geo Metro and bicycling, taking the bus. But what can I do? Um, you know, you just witness. And um, it's, it's progress. Um, the idea in transition is that we have parties instead of a protest. Um, I, I just I have to hold myself back from telling you all the stories, <laughs> but it's basically that we we shift from trying to educate people and inform and make people worried to getting people to relax and have a good time. And one of the ways that I encourage people to do this in the training is to think of your community in five categories. Um, list everybody that you think might possibly care about the community, from the senior center director to the guy who runs the health club uh, to the emergency medical technician and the guys down doing the volunteer fire department, um, the Kiwanis Club, the Rotary Club, everybody in town that cares about the community and has a sense of pride of living there or wants to have a sense of pride in living there and make a big list. And you sort the list into five very vague general categories. Ones, the people like you who are aware and active already. They're the resource groups. They're the, the people already doing projects that are wonderful sources of information and ideas for the community. The twos are the critical people for moving the community. People who are somewhat aware, but they're not active. And they're overwhelmed. They're going to stick their head in the sand if you hit them over the head with, <laughs> with the bad information. The threes who are neither aware nor active. And it's really important not to judge these folks. It's really important not to think that they are somehow apathetic, label them in some way of uncaring, or that they need their values changed. We have to toss all that judgmentalism right out the window. We are in a crisis. We don't have time to evaluate what people are buying and putting in their shopping carts. We are an emergency, and we need to really open our hearts to feel what their what their situation is. So those folks are not active. They don't seem to be aware, and we don't know why. But we want to, um, oh, we've got one minute. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple of um, tips here and um, a couple of pictures while we go through it. It's really important that you have an initiating group that represents the diversity of your community. And from that place, um, you work at three levels, head, hands, and heart. Um, you work at the heart level of caring relationships, and especially the hands level, the projects, the practical work. We've all seen how local food has taken off in this country. We've seen how local, everybody is talking community now. I mean, remember in the bad old days, seven years ago, we were talking about SUVs. We were talking about carbon diets. Now we're talking about community and relationships and rejuvenating our local economies. This is incredible how so many tens of thousands of us have shifted our language in a short amount of time. That's what's possible. So if we work at the hands level with those practical projects and we shift from judging people to really being curious as to what their lives are like, what we find out is that most people are terrified, ashamed, angry, Wounded, lonely, 40% of Americans 
40% of adults in this country don't have a single person that they talk to about what's going on in their lives. No wonder people drink alcohol. People in this country are in massive pain. And until we soften our hearts, until we reach out and are really curious and seek to understand the conditions of their lives, and then with collective genius, respond to them so we don't lose ourselves. I think of it as breathing. <laughs> we, uh, we are who we are. We want to give our gifts, and we want them to give their gifts. We need them to give their gifts because we're in a crisis. We've got to pile the sandbags on the riverbank. So how do we look at them with love, with friendship, and begin to see the synergies? And because of our biology, we want to find the synergies with each other. When you do outreach and connect with people and affirm and value the existing organizations in the community and ask them to give their gifts and then get 150, 200, 300, 500, 800 people together. Like folks in California did. We have some wonderful veterans of this work. When you get the tribe together in your community of neighbors, our social psychology kicks in, our biology kicks in. We are hardwired to want to be part of tribe. That's why conferences like this feel good. That's why teenagers rebel against their parents. They're waiting to be initiated into community. When we when we honor each other and we affirm each other's gifts, we actually do tremendous healing work for people. And we start to help them believe in themselves and have the courage to take action at a level that they didn't imagine. So what I love about this movement, and you don't have to call it transition, you don't have to join or be a part of it, or, but what I love about it is it's about our hearts coming together to encourage each other to have courage to go out into our communities and connect with people we don't even like. There's a great song at the end of the In Transition 1.0 movie. You'll have to open your door and make friends with people you always avoided before. And I could tell you just amazing stories of the kind of transformative work that starts to happen when you put all these good community organizing pieces and ingredients, that's what they call it in transition, together with this openness to be good neighbors to each other. There's a, the Dalai Lama says, um, I have this, this quote on my wall, never give up, no matter what happens, always keep going. Too much energy in the West has been focused on the head. Open your hearts. Work on developing compassion for each other because that's when real shift can happen. So it's a pleasure to be with you, and I'll stop there. <laughs>